Thanks, Sherry. Hey, Hi, Jackie. Hi, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Good, good. So I had some fun. I spent some time trying to find out, you know, who is Jackie? What does Jackie do? What I found out is Jackie's really smart. Um, so, so I don't want to get punked in this, in this interview. So um, the thing, though, that I really wanted to ask about was it seems like you started with a wiki because of your love for access of information. I did. Right? To be able to mm -hmm. share this information with the world, have you get this information out. Uh, you're just really smart. How do you share this stuff with the world? But it seems like you kind of um, stuck with wiki because of like the uh, community. So mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to like understand um, how did that kind of uh, play out uh, for you? Oh, sure. Yeah, actually, um, I started because um, I just love love knowledge and I recognize that it's a privilege. And this is something that happened through grad school. And I'm sure uh, many of you out there can empathize with this discussion. Um, but I started in grad school and said, well, education is a right. And of course, this has been something that stated many, many, many years ago. Um, by many um, governmental organizations and um, like the UN, things like that. Like, and we're talking in the 40s, um, this was stated. And I had professors say, well, education is a right. And I said, well, what, what, what gives you the authority as an educator to determine who gets these opportunities? And let's be honest, the opportunity gap is still huge. And it's something that um, isn't discussed often. And it's not just here in the US, but it's something that um, dealing with worldwide. Um, and I see Wikipedia as an opportunity to really equalize that. We have paywalled um, journals and information. Um, and I don't find that to be very equitable at all because information access, while it should be right, is a privilege. I mean, who has you know, access to to materials, university students, some libraries do, some public libraries too, but really, you know, do we want to limit knowledge in that way? Um, and it's something that I got involved with um, as an academic. I had finished my dissertation and I just all of a sudden felt empty. I thought, what now? I had like this big sense of loss because it's something that consumes your entire, you know, your entire time. And I'm sure we can all recognize, you know, a big project that we dealt with or, or something that all of a sudden it's like, whew, you know, they're just done. And I thought, well, what now? While I wait on edits, do I just sit clicking refresh on my email, waiting for, for feedback from my instructors? And um, my husband actually said, why don't you take this humongous document? Because I wrote a qualitative uh, dissertation. And so it was like 200 and some pages. It was a big guy. And um, he says, why don't you take some of those citations and put them into Wikipedia? I said, you know, sure. Okay. And so I started an account and that actually gave me something to keep my mind busy and transition from that humongous project. And then it just all kind of kept happening. I got involved with uh, the community and I recognized how engaging it felt. Uh, so I don't know if anybody else has been to an academic conference or just a conference, you know, that's felt very, very professional and very starchy and, and almost competitive and uncomfortable. And I, I thought, I don't want to relate to people in that way. I want to talk to people about change and and developing things that we can better the world, not fighting against each other. I mean, I, I didn't come here to like play gladiators, you know, poking each other, you know, with things about, you know, about this theory or that theory. I want to work together. And so I attended my first wiki conference in Montreal in August of 2017. And I left there feel, feeling so energized because I had so many different contacts and so many people were just excited about things. Um, and just everyone was working together for this common mission. And I thought, wow, that's that's what I like. I don't I don't want to battle anybody for anything. I want to work together to make this place better. Okay, okay. So I've noticed that you have a lot of really extensive work about disability bias. Can you mm -hmm. talk a bit about that and how you got into that? Because it seems like you're really, really into that. Yeah, yeah. I actually had started, um, I guess my first study was in 2008 um, that I started looking at what it is to have a disability in higher education. And um, that just kept going further. And then I also studied other marginalized populations like uh, international students on, on campus um, because a lot of times um, students, my fellow students were coming to me saying that they were so frustrated because the writing center wouldn't help them. They wouldn't give them extra time. They would just give them 
the same help as the native English speakers. I'm like, well, that's not equitable at all. Um, so I studied that experience. Um, and then I went and studied veterans on campus because I had uh, worked in the financial aid office and I had been working with a lot of veterans. I loved my veteran students. They were wonderful because they always come in with these tidy folders. All their documents were neat in a row and they were wonderful. They had everything. Um, so I, I talked with some of them and they said, well, we don't need the traditional undergraduate experience because they've already had their service experience. And so they were already grown at that point. You know, we have, we've all been, you know, that 18 year old where we make some mistakes and some choices that we shouldn't have made. Uh, whereas, you know, these people were coming in as, um, you know, 22, 26, 30, sometimes, you know, even 48 year old uh, student. And of course they, they're not gonna make the same choices as those 18 year olds. So they don't need that sort of guidance and student development. Um, so I studied them. And then I came back for my dissertation and I said, you know what, I think I want to study students with autism. And I started reading. I thought, you know what, I think I can just do a big study and say, what's the experience like for students in higher education? And what I found is that it was pretty generic that, you know, um, these colleges were giving sort of template responses. So if you're blind, you get these accommodations. If you're uh, student with anxiety, you get these accommodations. If you're a student with uh, a blood disorder and you need you know, accommodations, here's your accommodations. They were all the same. Mm. And I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense. That's not equi equitable at all. Sometimes it works. Like sometimes, sure, these two students need extra time, but it's it didn't seem um, very, very fair. So I thought, okay, I want to go deeper in this. And so that's that's where I did. And hopefully, eventually, I will study the experience of uh, people editing Wikipedia with disabilities. So that'd be mm. something curious to know, especially um, on Wikipedia as some of the essays and comments on Wikipedia haven't been very disability friendly. Um, so I'd like to know that experience of people and what's, what's going on there. That's really interesting. Really, really interesting. I also noticed that you are a bit of a linguist. Seems like mm -hmm. you speak German pretty I well. Do. And yeah. um, it sounds like you're pretty uh, uh, useful in Spanish as well. Is that something that you just picked up or do you have a, like a specific interest in languages? I do. I actually have. Um, I started taking German when I was about 11 and um, that continued. And I just went uh, and I double majored in um, my undergrad. I did physics and German um, and then I just uh, dropped my physics to my minor so I could graduate and uh, go forward. Um, but I kept German as my major and it's actually still something that I use. Um, I speak it at home just to try to get my children to know a second language. Um, which has worked okay. Um, we'll just say okay. Um, but then um, now in my daily life with wikis, I actually um, speak German quite a bit. Of course, sometimes it's a bit rusty and, and not so good after so many years. Um, and actually Spanish is something that um, I found important to start learning because we have such a high population of Spanish speakers in the United States that I felt like it's just something important uh, to learn right now. Have you seen any issues with with accessing Wiki as far as like, you know, the Wikipedians with people that don't mm -hmm. speak English? I know it was kind of, I brought up a little mm -hmm. bit earlier in the talk, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you have, have seen or experienced that as well. Yeah, yeah, you know, language is a huge barrier and that's something that I think that we don't talk about, not just accessing um, Wikipedia, but just spaces in general. And that's uh, something that I hope that we can move forward because a lot of our conferences and um, discussions, communication, it all happens in English, which is very convenient for me, but not at all convenient for a lot of people out there who are wanting to be included. And it's not at all equitable. Um, so it's something that hopefully we can come up with solutions to in the future. Um, you know, we've had some live translations in the past during conferences, which is amazing and wonderful. Um, but that's something that we don't regularly do, which I know there's a cost factor to that, but um, it'd be nice if we could uh, be more inclusive and equitable in the future. I also want to say that um, I saw that you were referenced on Drunk History, which is a show I love to watch on YouTube. 
So I was <laughs> pretty excited when I saw that. And I was like, oh my God, you're like a real celebrity. So I was going to say shout out to that. I'm not sure if you were as excited as I was when that happened, but I was pretty excited to see that that, that happened. You know, I was, because actually the article, um, it's actually a page I created on Wikipedia. It is the 504 sit-ins. So anybody go uh, go look that up right now, because it's actually something interesting. Um, a whole bunch of people with disabilities occupied a federal building. And they're like, what do we do? Do we arrest these people in wheelchairs? <laughs> they didn't know what to do. So it was like, uh, how do we do this? You know, And uh, it was actually because um, their, their rights were not being established you know, during um, the, let's see, now I'm blanking on the year. Um, it was 1977. And so it had been several years since the signing of um, the People with Disabilities Act. Now I'm blanking on it. Sorry, much too much coffee, too little sleep lately. But anywho, um, the gist of it is, is that people were not getting their, their rights met um, at this point, even though they were already guaranteed. And so they occupy this, um, this facility in San Francisco and um, that you know, no one, nobody knew what to do, and so in the end, people got arrested and things like that. But there wasn't a Wikipedia page about that. I'm like, that was so cool and so awesome, yeah. and nobody there. It was just a blurb in um, you know the disability rights movement um, page. So I created that, and then lo and behold, a few weeks later, it was mentioned on or a few weeks once I don't know it was mentioned on Drunk History. I thought that's awesome. <laughs> so that was really great. Technology like yeah. motion that's pretty dope. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, Wikipedia can get you on drunk history. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. you too, Aiden, for us. Well, thank you, Jackie. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.